All right, so good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to join us for our second of two public open houses uh, to learn more about the draft village urban design guidelines. Uh, my name is Matt Rodriguez, uh, and I'm a uh, planner here with WSP, uh, and uh, I'll be facilitating today's public open house. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague Bobby Gauthier from WSP, uh, and we'll get to uh, proper introductions um, in just a little bit. Um, we're here today to seek your input and feedback uh, as the township and project team work to finalize the village urban design guidelines. Uh, so this is a really uh, exciting uh, milestone in the project uh, as we walk through some of the key elements, uh, but also the background and how we arrived at the design guidelines that you may have had a chance to review already. We'll start today's session with some introductions to the project team. Uh, Bobby will then walk through a presentation that provides an overview of the process, uh, what we've done in the past um, and where we're at now and, and, and what is in the draft village urban design guidelines. And so uh, a really comprehensive presentation uh, to cover off uh, some of the key things that you might need to know. We'll then be saving a good amount of time at the end of today's session for a Q&A period and open discussion. And so I uh, hope uh, you have some questions and, and our uh, uh, the whole project team is here to uh, respond to those. We'll then wrap up this evening and just provide uh, an overview of some of the next steps and what you can expect uh, as the township advances the Village Urban Design Guidelines project. So just for a little bit of background, uh, the Village Urban Design Guidelines review began in uh, 2021. Um, and so it started with a discussion paper and some public consultation, and uh, we'll get into that in a bit more detail later. Uh, and, and we're really excited to be here today uh, to be presenting the draft Village Urban Design Guidelines. This is an exciting and important document for the township. Um, and we're really looking forward to seeking your input and feedback on it uh, before we bring it forward to finalize it. So uh, again, really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to join us. So just in terms of how to participate in today's public open house, there's a few ways that you can do this. Uh, first, you can raise your hand if you wish to speak. Uh, there's the raise, I can't, raise hand icon rather in the meeting control bar, or if you're on Windows, you can press Alt Y or a Mac Option Y. Uh, or if you're joining us over the phone and there may be a couple tonight, uh, you can press star nine to raise your hand and then once called upon star six to unmute and mute your microphone. Throughout the session, uh, you're also welcome to pop your question or comment in the chat box. And so that can be accessed in the toolbar, uh, either at the bottom or top of your screen, depending on your uh, layout. Uh, and, and certainly would welcome those comments or questions as we go, just in case you do, uh, don't want to forget. Just a couple quick housekeeping items as well uh, for the benefit of the group. Uh, as you heard, we are recording this session, uh, and this is so that we can post it afterwards to the township speaking engagement page. Uh, so if you do miss something today or want to share it with someone who is unable to join, uh, the video link will be up within the next few days uh, and you'll be able to uh, view it at your own leisure or rewatch certain uh, uh, parts of today's presentation. We do ask that you remain muted uh, throughout the session until called upon during the Q&A, uh, just to avoid any uh, unnecessary background noise, uh, so your cooperation is really appreciated. So to kick off the introductions, uh, I'll pass it over to uh, Aloma Dreyer at the Township of King uh, to introduce the Township Project Team. Thanks, Matt, and uh, thank you everyone who's in attendance tonight. We look forward to receiving your comments and feedback on the draft uh, today and following the meeting. I'm Aloma Dreyer. I'm the senior policy planner with the township. Uh, in attendance tonight from the township as well, we have Kristen Harrison, the manager of policy planning, and Stephen Naylor, the director of growth management services. We also have uh, Felix Chow in attendance. Uh, he's one of the development planners with the township. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Aloma. Uh, and then I'll pass it over uh, to, uh, to Bobby Gauthier from WSP, who will uh, introduce himself and then also carry on forward with uh, this evening's presentation. So Bobby, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks very much, Matt. Um, so good evening, everyone. And I'll reiterate what everybody's said so far is uh, thanks for joining us uh, tonight. We absolutely appreciate your time. Um, so today, today's presentation uh, is really focused presenting the draft urban design guidelines for review and input. So we're quite a ways from making a final decision on the document that'll likely go to council early in the new year. So there's lots of time for us to be collecting your feedback. And that's really the purpose of today's meeting. Um, unfortunately, our colleague, John Taziopoulos sends us regrets. He was not able to join us tonight, uh, but certainly we'll be integrating him into the comments we receive.
Okay, so getting into the presentation, um, the presentation will be about 30, 30 minutes long or so. So we'll use most of the evening tonight to uh, focus on the Q&A and, and start to receive some of your comments and your feedback. So starting out the presentation at a high level, what are urban design guidelines and what is urban design? So I like to think of urban design as being some kind of a cross between uh, the disciplines of urban planning, community planning, uh, and architecture. So urban design is concerned with the uh, shaping the built environment, shaping the places that we live, work, and play, uh, addressing things like where buildings are located on properties in relation to the street, how large buildings are, uh, the massing, the height, and, and also architectural features of, guide, of, uh, of buildings. So urban design guidelines, of course, it follows that they're a series of design statements. So they're their objectives and uh, intended outcomes of, of what the township wants to see with urban design. And the urban design guidelines, as you'll see in the presentation that we've drafted, address a very wide range of different topics. So they, they address what we call built form. Built form is a term you'll probably hear me use numerous times in the presentation. And built form is, is a broad term that uh, refers to the, the location of buildings, the, the size of buildings, the massing, uh, um, and sort of the treatment of the envelope of buildings in relation to the public realm and the streetscape. The urban design guidelines also address architectural treatment. So you'll find some guidelines as we'll go through that pertain to building materials, architectural detailing, uh, cladding, and, and, uh, and fenestration or, or the treatment of windows. Um, the guidelines also address the theme of mobility, so um, it, providing some guidance on how buildings can be conducive to walkability and how they can address the streetscape and activate the street edge, get people moving and walking rather than using their cars. You'll see that as a key theme throughout this presentation. Uh, the urban design guidelines also address the public realm, so they address the, the public areas of our communities, so the streetscapes, the trails, uh, the connectivity, the parks, and, and other open spaces. The urban design guidelines also address heritage. So they speak to things like uh, the need to maintain heritage structures and, and older buildings, and also the need for new development to be sensitive and compatible with existing heritage buildings. But it also addresses historic aspects of communities. You'll see that a big theme of these guidelines is about being sensitive to, uh, to existing historic context of our neighborhoods. Okay, so next slide, Matt. So a few words about the overall intent and objectives of the project. So um, mainly the purpose of this project is to provide a review and an update to the township's existing urban design guidelines and to prepare a set of consolidated urban design guidelines. So to create sort of a one-stop shop for all of the, the township's guidelines. You may know that the township has administered guidelines for some time, and I'll talk about that uh, on a subsequent slide. Another very key objective of this project is to implement the new official plan, along with many other studies. And the official plan speaks to um, community planning and urban design objectives. And it speaks to things like being sustainable and, and ensuring that new development is of a high quality nature. So we'll be talking about what some of the project drivers are a bit later in the presentation. The existing guidelines, I'll say, they serve as a base for the new urban design guidelines. So we've, we've leveraged work that the township's done previously and built upon that in consideration of some other studies the township's done recently, as well as uh, thinking about modern development pressures. And the project is also informed by a discussion paper. So if you've participated in the urban design guidelines project thus far, you might, you might have attended an open house uh, last year where a discussion paper was prepared. Uh, and, and that served as kind of the basis for, for the structure of these urban design guidelines that we're presenting here today in draft. Uh, next slide. Design guidelines uh, thus far in the township. You'll see that uh, there are urban design guidelines for what the township at the time called the village centers, and they address each of the three villages of King City, Nobleton, and Schomburg. And those documents date to uh, February of 2006. So they are a little bit outdated at this point, and they most definitely uh, predate the township's new official plan by almost or over 10 years. 
The township also has some design guidelines for its employment areas. I'll talk about what the employment areas are uh, on a later slide, but those also date to, uh, to 2007. So what, what, what I think is an important point to make about the existing guidelines is they're, they're not as comprehensive as the township would like them to be. Like the existing guidelines don't address the established neighborhoods and they don't address all of the various uh, planned intensification areas within the villages. So there are some significant gaps that we're looking to fill uh, as part of developing these new urban design guidelines. Um, next slide. So a few words on the work plan for the project. So the, the process that we're following to complete these urban design guidelines. We're following a three phase work program. The first phase began in spring of last year and it was sort of the background review. We completed a, a discussion paper, like I mentioned earlier, to serve as the basis for the, for the design guidelines and to give a sense as to some of the key issues and the key matters that needed to be considered. Um, a series of public open houses were held, uh, I believe in the summer of last year, and, and that was to consult on the draft discussion paper. And then the discussion paper was subsequently finalized and we had a, there was a council meeting in the fall of last year. So since then, the, the draft guidelines have been completed in draft for consultation. And we're, we're here tonight in phase two uh, to, to conduct um, a series of public open houses. You may know that we had an open house last night and this is, this is two of two tonight. After tonight, um, as I said, our intent is to collect feedback and comments. And that, that started last night. We had great positive feedback and a lot of excellent questions last night. And, and we'll certainly see what, uh, what feedback we get tonight. And I think subsequent to that, we'll, we'll be certainly accepting and, and happy to, to take written comments as we move to finalize the design guidelines towards the end of the year. Um, there's a, a planned uh, update with council, and that's just sort of a status update to explain uh, the process thus far and some of the comments received to date. We have a tentative date for that on uh, November 7th, I believe. And then after that, we'll finalize the guidelines, collect all the input, address all the comments from council and everyone else, and we'll move towards a council adoption uh, to be considered in the, the first quarter of next year. So there's a fair bit of time to provide your, your comments so far. And, and just to emphasize this, you know, we're at the stage where we're, we're looking to consult on these draft guidelines and, and not, not quite ready to, to move forward to finalize, but uh, rather to, to give some orientation to that tonight. Next slide, please. So I mentioned uh, last year, there were a series of public open houses uh, to have some discussions around each of the villages and to inform that discussion paper that was produced in the first phase of the project. So this slide uh, attempts to characterize some of the comments that we heard um, and, and to give some kind of a summary of some of the key points. So I'll just go over some of these uh, fairly quickly. Uh, so in Schaumburg, one of the things we heard is the need to maintain a safe and a friendly community. And certainly I think, you know, Schaumburg has a very nice uh, small town kind of a feel to it. So with respect to the urban design guidelines, how can we balance uh, the need for, for some development and intensification uh, with, with uh, maintaining that small town feel and character? Um, some people indicated that there's a need to make Schaumburg more, more walkable. So how can the public realm be improved to be more conducive to walkability and, and connectivity in, the, in, in Schaumburg. And another comment related to ensuring buildings are aesthetically compatible and mix well with the historic context of Schaumburg. I think that's a very important point because uh, in Schaumburg, there's a very, uh, very attractive characteristic uh, historic main street feel to it. So it's very important that buildings, they're not just compatible from a land use point of view, but also compatible from as it says, an aesthetic or an architectural point of view to create a, a cohesive uh, appearance to the streetscape. So that, that was, uh, I, th I think, a very important comment that we've, I, I think, uh, addressed quite well in, in these draft guidelines. In Nobleton, we've heard some, some similar comments. There was a comment about improving and beautifying the core area, which you know has some challenges when you think of the regional roads on the core area, but how can the guidelines be used to, to help drive uh, and, and guide public realm improvements, but also uh, bringing buildings somewhat closer to the street while still allowing for some uh, public realm amenities. 
We heard a comment about providing guidance for replacement homes, a, a very important comment. And you know, certainly the township has seen many instances of older homes being purchased and rebuilt with, with much larger buildings, much larger homes and footprints. So how can the guidelines help to guide those new homes in a way that they're more sensitive to the characteristics of each individual neighborhood? And we heard about uh, the need to improve the public realm, addressing facade improvements as well as street furniture and landscaping. So again, how can we kind of soften the streetscape to, to address those busy regional roads and make Nobleton more walkable? And then King City, I think we heard some similar themes. So we heard about the need to preserve heritage and character. Certainly there's a concentration of historic buildings and, and a built form character in King City. Uh, and there's a need to have some guidance to make sure that any intensification is being sensitive to that historic, historic character. Again, just like in Nobleton, there's a need to address replacement and info homes. So King City has had a lot of pressure uh, just as in Nobleton to, to um, see homes purchased, uh, demolished with, with, with larger homes built in their place. So how can the guidelines help to guide that again in a more sensitive manner uh, and, and in a way that's contextual to the specific neighborhood too? How can we improve the public realm and guide the public realm via these guidelines was an important point. And also promoting active transportation in King City. So how can the guidelines help to Again, uh, get people out of their cars and, and walking around more in King City by providing better streetscape amenities, but also more convenient and accessible access to sidewalks by locating buildings close to the street and activating, activating the facade, as, as we often say. So a lot of excellent comments, and hopefully I characterized what some of those, uh, some of those key themes were. Uh, next slide, please. So the study area for the urban design guidelines, just at a, at a quick high level, uh, we're talking mainly about the villages and, and especially the built up areas of the villages. So, and also specifically where the guidelines apply, but the guidelines do not apply to the rural or the hamlet areas of the township, what we call the countryside of the township. Um, th these guidelines are focused specifically on the villages and they're also focused on some certain key areas within the villages. So we'll, we'll go through what that means in the, in the forthcoming slides. Next slide, please. So the village uh, guideline component. So if you had had a chance to look at um, the guidelines in draft posted on the website thus far, you'll see that there's three chapters which actually contain the guidelines. There's a couple of other chapters on um, introduction and, and implementation, but the, the, the kind of uh, the center of, of the document where the guidelines are contained are organized into a chapter on what we call the village centers, a chapter on the established neighborhoods, and a chapter on the employment areas. And these three areas are uh, related to designations in the township's new official plan. So we're providing guidance for what we call the village centers, which consists of the village cores, the mixed use areas, and the transit station area. Um, so th those are intended as the focus of intensification in the, in the township. And I'll, I'll uh, illustrate what those areas are on, on the next few slides. And then the other chapter is on the established neighborhoods, which are sort of the, the, sta the more stable, mature neighborhoods in the, in the township, uh, which have been experiencing that, that pressure for replacement homes. So that's another chapter. And then the employment areas. So the employment areas are those areas designated by the township uh, for specifically accommodating the majority of, of what we call employment growth. So things like offices and, and light manufacturing uses. So th that's, that's sort of how the guidelines are organized in a nutshell. The next slide, please. And then drilling down a little bit more into what those areas are. So looking at Nobleton, um, so Nobleton um, has, of course, Village Core, and the Village Core is centered around King Road and Highway 27. You can kind of see that in, in the light orange. Um, the established neighborhoods, when I'm talking about the established neighborhoods, I'm talking about that, that sort of vibrant yellow color that you see designated uh, throughout the community. And what I think I recognize with the established neighborhoods, just how much diversity there is in, in the neighborhoods. Every single one of those neighborhoods has a different character to it, a different lot fabric, different um, uh, street pattern. 
and and certainly if you if you visit the neighborhoods you'll see it, it has a different feel in terms of open space and, and setbacks and so on and then there are a few mixed use areas in nobleton as well so uh, there's there's a concentration or a strip of mixed use area on the south side of king road and and then on highway 27 sort of at the north end of the village there's a couple of uh, of mixed use areas and, and again, the village core and the mixed use areas are, are where intensification is planned to occur. So there's a need for some design guidelines uh, to address that. And then the employment area is, is the light blue color just at the south, the south end of the village. So the guidelines also will address future development in that area. Next slide. So looking at Schaumburg, a little bit, uh, a little bit similar um, in terms of the application of the guidelines. So there's also a village core, but this this village core is centered around Main Street. Um, there are again a diversity of established neighborhoods in Schaumburg, and and you see that in that that bright yellow color. There's a couple of mixed use area sites, um, sort of particularly on the west side of Highway 27. And then again, there's uh, quite a large employment area in Schaumburg, and that's all on the east side of Highway 27. So the guidelines will address all of these uh, all of these areas as shown on the map. Next slide, please. And then King City, just uh, along those lines, there's the village core is uh, a fair bit more extensive in King City compared to the other the other villages. So that's uh, principally along King Road, but also along some of the side streets. There's a transit station area um, you see in sort of that plum color, and that's basically the areas that can accommodate some intensification um, near the King City GO station. So you see that sort of along uh, Keel Street. Again, just like in Nobleton and to some extent in Schaumburg, there's a, a big variety of different established neighborhoods across King City, all dating to different periods and having all kinds of different characteristics. Uh, mixed use areas. Uh, you see just a few pockets of mixed use areas, a little bit hard to see on the map, but there's a small pocket of it uh, on the north side of King Road at the far, the far westerly portion of the village. And then uh, again, a, a couple of pockets of, of mixed use uh, just on the north and south sides of King Road, just west of Dufferin Street. And then there's one employment area. You can, you can see that in the light blue color on the south side of King Road. So the, the guidelines will address all of these different areas and address sort of their unique needs. Okay, next slide, please. So um, if you, again, if you've had a chance to look at the guidelines uh, under chapter one, the introduction, uh, you'll find a key section is the guiding principles. And the guiding principles to me are sort of these broad visionary statements about what the guidelines are intending to achieve. And to some extent, each of the guidelines works to achieve at least one of these principles. So the principles are, are very much driving the content of the guidelines. So I think it's worthwhile to review what those principles say and, and, and sort of what they're trying to, uh, trying to uh, achieve in the villages. So the first guiding principle is about maintaining and enhancing each village's historic small town character. I, and I think that's, uh, that's stated first uh, intentionally because, um, you know, King has been uh, undergoing pressure for intensification, pressure for um, replacement homes, as I said, and, and certainly uh, there will be future employment land development. So there's a need to ensure that development respects that overall uh, small scale and, and, and character of the communities. Promoting communities and a connected animated pedestrian network, you'll see that that's a big theme in the guidelines. Um, wherever possible, we want to try to promote uh, uh, trail connections and bringing buildings close to the street, promoting bicycle uh, parking and, and cycling usage. So, and, and that just brings about a, a healthier, more connected and vibrant community. You'll see another principle is achieving excellence in architecture, design, sustainability. Um, very, very key uh, policies in the official plan speak to, uh, you know, the townships uh, expectations when it comes to architecture and design. So using high quality materials, you, having a significant articulation of facades, not having big, long, boring facades, but making things more interesting and, and achieving uh, sustainability uh, wh where possible. Maintaining and enhancing individual character of established neighborhoods. So 
you know, as I said, these established neighborhoods have been undergoing pressure when it comes to replacement homes and, and other other matters. So, uh, and, and, and as al also, as I've said, every one of those neighborhoods is different. So when development does occur, it should occur in a way that's uh, sensitive to the individual neighborhood. And that's another guiding principle uh, that I think is quite key. Ensuring development interfaces sensitively, sensitively with the existing built form. So, you know, that kind of speaks to principle one as well. But, um, you know, what we're talking about is ensuring that intensification is compatible with adjacent low rise areas and that the mixed use areas provide some kind of transitional uh, built form as you move into the village cores. So that, that's certainly another principle that I think has guided a lot of, a, a number of the guidelines in the document. Uh, next slide, please. Connect and develop the township's recreational network. I kind of spoke to that already, but you know, any opportunities to create trail connections and enhance the enhance the uh, the walkability of the communities and, and the cycling friendly design of the communities should be identified and explored through the development review process. Enhancing the natural heritage system. So the township, of course, you know, maintains a whole bunch of different documents that that protect the natural heritage system. So the the role of the urban design guidelines. Uh, is to try to find opportunities to enhance it. So are, are there ways of identifying and, and respecting, you know, nice views and vistas of natural heritage features uh, to help promote appreciation for those features through site design? Welcoming visitors and residents with gateway, attractive gateways and focal points. Um, that's another key theme in the guidelines is that you know, certain sites have a certain prominence, right? They might be at the gateway of a village. They might be at the corner of two of two uh, major roads, you know, th those particular focal points, those visual focal points need to be treated in a certain way, either through enhanced landscaping, through gateway features, or through enhanced architectural treatment. Promoting a holistic approach to site and building sustainability. Sustainability is a very key theme in the guidelines as it is in the official plan. And where possible, um, you know, developers and, and builders should be identifying and incorporating uh, innovative sustainable elements into their into their project, whether that be uh, site design, whether that be you know encouraging uh, uh, renewable energy generation or uh, permeable surfaces to allow for water infiltration and, uh, and other elements should always be explored through the design process. And then supporting active transportation and multimodal travel with built form. So built form plays a role when it comes to uh, getting people out of their cars and and you know, onto the sidewalks, you know, buildings should be oriented to sidewalks and parking areas kind of uh, put to the back of buildings to help with that, uh, to help with that objective. So that's a summary of, of those 10 guiding principles. And I think also gives a little bit of a sense of, of what you'll, you'll see in the guidelines. Uh, next slide, please. So the guidelines are guided by a framework of uh, overarching statements, policies, and plans. So I've mentioned that um, the guidelines were a based on the existing guidelines, but also incorporate different inputs. And, and really, the township has a, a very large toolbox when it's viewing development applications. And I view the, the urban design guidelines as being yet another tool to round out that toolbox. But the, the official plan has certainly driven the guidelines, probably in, in the most significant way. You know, the, the guidelines uh, are were really, uh, I think, initiated to help implement many of the, the design objectives that you'll see stated in the official plan. And the guidelines also are intended to work in conjunction with some of those other, uh, those other studies that you see listed on the slide among, amongst other, uh, other tools and documents. Next slide. So I keep talking about the official plan and I haven't yet described it. So it's worth giving a few words about what that document is. So you may know that the township implemented or adopted rather an official plan uh, in September of 2019. So it's a fairly new document. And the official plan is a very key planning policy document. It's the document that explains where growth is going to occur in the township uh, and, and what the objectives are for, for directing and, and guiding what that growth is going to look like. And as I've kind of indicated before, the official plan directs most intensification commercial use, um, uh, including mixed use towards the designations. So there's a need to have guidelines that, that will uh, 
uh, shape what that growth is going to look like in, in light of those policies of the official plan. The official plan also speaks to maintaining the character of this existing uh, mature neighborhoods. So the guidelines will play a role in helping to implement that key policy directive. And there are also policies to protect the employment areas and also to ensure that the employment areas are uh, guided by um, objectives of sustainability and, and high quality of design so that they don't end up being, you know, if, you, if you've seen some employment areas in, in, in many municipalities, they can be a little bit, a little bit bland, which is a bit challenging because a lot of the employment areas in the township, like I showed on the maps, they're sort of at the gateways of a lot of the villages. So they kind of create this visual impression of, of the township. And I think there's a particular need to, to enhance uh, the appearance of, uh, of, of new buildings and development uh, within those gateway areas. My next slide, please. Okay, so um, the following kind of series of slides, I'll do my best to kind of summarize what I think some of the key guidelines actually are. You can appreciate it's, it's quite a, a lengthy document of, of urban design guidelines. There's, a, there's certainly a lot that could be uh, spoken about and, and presented tonight, but um, I've, I've kind of pulled some of the key themes and, and objectives that I think are of interest. So starting with the village centers, uh, some of the key guidelines that you'll find is, uh, as I said before, locating buildings close to the sidewalk and activating the street edge. So creating, creating a vibrant streetscape, I think is hugely dependent on shaping built form in a way that addresses the streetscape and creates a more enclosed and walkable uh, community. community. Respecting overall scale with minimum two stories and the use of upper story step, back, step backs. So as I've said, um, it's, it is a challenge to guide intensification in a manner that's gonna be respectful of the overall scale of the villages. So uh, the guidelines promote two stories as being sort of the predominantly um, historically established uh, building heights. And where buildings are going to be greater than two stories, the upper story should be set, stepped back, which means the, the upper story should be uh, further set back from, from the, the front of the building facade. That helps to kind of soften uh, the, the visual impact on the streetscape. Emphasize views and vistas to key features. So through site design and, and massing, if there's um, an attractive uh, natural heritage feature or something of that nature that needs to be emphasized, that should be made. Uh, maintain a transition through incorporation of step backs and angular planes. So um, in some cases, some of the intensification areas, they, they are adjacent to low rise areas. So there's a need to have some guidance around uh, ensuring that buildings will be compatible from, from a privacy and a shadow, and, and also from a visual perspective, there should be some transition in height and angular planes and setbacks are just two of the, the tools that we can use to help create that transition. Next slide, please. So a few more words on the village centers. So um, promoting development that addresses the streetscape, so as I think I've said, bringing buildings up to the streetscape and activating the street edge with, you know, with interesting land uses and, and shops and so on. Uh, parking is intended to be principally located in the rear yard uh, in the village centers. They can, it can be in the side yards just in a few specific circumstances, but in large part, the guidelines intend to see parking to the rear of the property. And again, that's about bringing buildings up to the streetscape. Achieving compatibility uh, between new development existing low rise areas. I think I've spoken to that. Shaping development to be pedestrian oriented and provide buffering from adjacent busy regional roads. That's a big challenge in King City and in Schaumburg is you know, how, how can you use um, the urban design guidelines to shape development in a way that is going to promote streetscape activity, recognizing some of the impacts from those busy roads. And you can do that through some public realm improvements and, and providing for a more substantial public realm and, and sort of pedestrian uh, boulevard. Promoting architectural excellence and sustainable design is, a, as I said, a key theme of the guidelines. So you'll see that it's intended through the application of the guidelines that the township will encourage uh, innovation and sustainability, and then they'll want to see that come forward as part of development. The next slide. Just a few more words on the village centers. So, streetscape. So you can kind of utilize architectural uh, elements like horizontal, consistent horizontal elements 
um, to create some visual harmony on a streetscape. And I think that's very important in, in the, the village center context. So through design, there should be consideration, not just for um, you know, maintaining similar setbacks, but also thinking about what those cohesive visual elements are on the streetscape and trying to carry them through as part of new development. Integrating architectural elements like windows and high quality traditional building materials. Um, you know, the guidelines try to discourage uh, more economical materials like stucco and promote masonry and, and more attractive architectural treatment and, and, um, and detailing. Optimizing for accessibility, incorporating green technology and sustainability. That certainly is spoken to in the guidelines as, um, you know, ensuring that new development is, is highly accessible and, um, and promotes activity for all residents. Guiding a range of building typologies, including townhouses, low-rise, multi-dwelling units. Um, you know, the, the, villa, the policies of the official plan do provide permission for a very wide range of different development types in different circumstances. There's criteria in the official plan, but there could be all kinds of different townhouses. There could be um, a, a variety of different low rise and, and multi-dwelling units, mixed use buildings. So if, if you've had a chance to look at the guidelines, you'll see that there are specific guidelines that pertain to every, every conceivable building typology that could be permitted uh, within the village centers. And, and I think that level of detail is, is quite necessary here. Next slide. So that, that's a bit of a summary of the guidelines for the village centers. So just shifting over to the established neighborhoods um, and, and some of the key objectives. So one, of the, one very key objective is about compatibility and, and height transition. So I think one of the impacts that, that people have seen in some of the older neighborhoods is that you know, a, new, a new house has been built, that it's replaced an older home and, and it's of a, 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 much, uh, a much greater height. And, and there's sort of this very stark contrast in height and, and that's not only concerning from a compatibility point of view, like in terms of privacy and overlook and shadow, but also from a visual point of view, it's not necessarily respectful of the original development pattern. And it, and it can be kind of visually um, unappealing in some cases. So the guidelines really do speak to creating transition and height and, and using roof lines and, and creating uh, some harmony and transition in, in the roof lines to help achieve that. Uh, setbacks that promote spaciousness and align with neighboring dwellings. So, you know, generally speaking, new homes should be aligned with, with adjacent dwellings in terms of their, their setbacks. Um, you know, one, a new home shouldn't be super close to the, to the street uh, if, if the other homes are set back considerably. Right? And that's about creating, creating compatibility, but also creating that, uh, that more cohesive visual, uh, visual harmony. Uh, the guidelines speak to entrances as being a focal feature. So you know, they should be treated nicely with, with good architectural detailing. It shouldn't be a boring entry, but something that, that conveys that, hey, this is sort of that transition between the public realm and, and the private realm. Uh, and, and that can, I think, does, does a, well, it plays a huge role in um, creating a more, a more attractive building. Our next slide, please. Just a few more uh, key guidelines in the established neighborhoods. So again, using high quality materials, I mentioned that with respect to uh, the village centers, but the same is true in, in the established neighborhoods, you know, promoting the use of, of masonry and, and more traditional building materials. Um, there, there are a number of guidelines that speak to garages and driveways. And as a general rule of thumb, we're trying to avoid the dominance of garages and driveways on the front facade. And, and promoting more soft landscaping is a, is a key objective. So, and, and you can do that by, an, you know, with a number of different means uh, with respect to garages, you can, you know, set them back, um, have a little bit of division between garage doors, not, not very large garage doors, but, uh, you know, having columns that separate them to help create a bit more visual, uh, visual interest in the facade. Uh, preserving mature trees is very important and adding new trees Promoting landscaping is key. A lot of the established neighborhoods, I think, are characterized by, uh, in particular, by their mature vegetation. And, th and that's part of what uh, contributes to that character. So, uh, so the guidelines very much uh, intend for that to be preserved to the extent possible. Next slide. And just a few more uh, points on the established neighborhoods. So providing permeable surfaces, minimizing hardscaping is 
uh, a beneficial idea from a sustainability point of view, locating accessory structures in the rear side yards to, to form part of visual transition. So it's not just the house, it's also the accessory structures. Sometimes they can be quite, quite dominant and, and they need to be thoughtfully located and designed. Uh, additions, you'll, you'll see some guidelines for, for home additions. In some cases, people, uh, they buy the home, they don't necessarily want to take it down, they want to put an addition on. So there are some guidelines that speak to that uh, and, and addressing roof lines to create sort of a, a more harmonious uh, appearing building. And then promoting the use of non-invasive species for street plantings. Uh, and, and there are some guidelines that speak to road sections and style that help to re retain those original rural qualities. Next slide. So in the employment areas, uh, just a few points on that. So as I said, that's the other chapter of the guidelines. I think that you know the the guidelines really speak to achieving a high standard of design. So you know, looking for elements of sustainability, certainly promoting accessibility, but also creating more visually interesting employment building facades. That that's I think very key when it comes to this kind of context. To the extent possible, also activating the street edge for office or ancillary uses. So trying to bring buildings a little bit closer to the street and, and promoting a little bit of walkability uh, within the employment areas. Next slide. Um, I think I've mentioned this, emphasizing architectural excellence. Um, again, uh, high quality building materials, I think make a huge difference in, in making uh, employment areas more attractive. Uh, setting out um, uh, heights, I, I think I think a minimum of two stories would typically be preferred. Um, the maximum height would be guided in, in the zoning and the official plan. Um, and enhancing building entrances through through amenities as well. So, you know, I, I keep saying that is articulating building entrances. I think makes a big difference in in um, in sort of the appearance of the facade. And you can do that through architectural treatment, but also through the provision of some landscaping and and helping to better connect uh, the sidewalk and, and the parking areas into, the, uh, into the, uh, the building entry so that it's a bit more thoughtfully designed for people and, and not just for cars. Uh, next slide. So just a few final words, I'm going a bit over what I intended. Um, a few final words on implementation. Um, so I think, I think this is an important point. It came up a lot in yesterday's Q and A discussion. So the guidelines, uh, will be implemented by township staff and principally through a development review process. So the guidelines don't sit on a shelf. They, they, they are very much an active implementation tool for the township to review all kinds of development applications. Um, and and as, as I said, the township has a big toolbox of other complementary tools. And, and it also processes all kinds of different development applications from site plans and minor variances even um, applications under the community improvement plan for facade uh, improvements and other, uh, other incentives. So all of these things uh, can utilize the urban design guidelines to help uh, guide and shape development in a, in a more desirable way. In some cases, the township might require a whole report an urban design brief in conjunction with some major development. And it'll, the onus is on the, uh, the developer to demonstrate how the guidelines are being addressed through the development application. And in some cases, the township may engage a third party peer review consultant, and, and, and that's to help bring some outside expertise that the township may not have uh, to promote uh, the implementation of the guidelines in, in a more thoughtful way. So uh, next slide, Matt. So I think that wraps up the presentation. Sorry, I went a bit longer than I intended, but um, we'll certainly use the rest of the time for the Q&A. So back to you, Matt. Thank you so much, Bobby, and uh, thanks for the, that, that great overview presentation that I think covered off a lot of the key elements of the design guidelines. And uh, if you've had a chance to read it, hopefully you sort of reiterated some of the things that you noticed. And uh, if you haven't had a chance to read them just yet, uh, hopefully sort of a bit of a primer uh, before you uh, jump into that uh, uh, document. So as I mentioned before, uh, we're having a, we, we've saved quite a bit of time for a Q&A uh, portion of the session. Um, and so uh, the again, uh, there's a couple ways to participate. The first is to raise your hand uh, using the control bar or, or some of the tools that are shown on the screen. And I'll, I'll keep this slide up for a little bit just uh, in case people need a refresher. Uh, and then you're also welcome to uh, use the chat box to type your question uh, or comment. Uh, 
Again, just a, a friendly reminder that we are recording this session and we'll, we will be posting it to the speaking page uh, in the days following today's session. Um, and so if you do miss something uh, or want to refresh yourself, you'll have an opportunity to do so. Uh, and lastly, we just remind you to remain muted until called upon. All right. And off into the questions we go. So I, I see a, a first question, um, and um, uh, and, and I, I may put this to, to Kristen first. Um, uh, and the, the question is, would Metrolinx, and for those who may not be aware, Metrolinx is a provincial agency uh, that, that deals with transit, uh, trains and buses, um, would they be required to follow these guidelines? So Kristen, I don't know if that's something or Bobby could weigh in on as well. Uh, good evening, and thanks for kicking it off with that question. Um, certainly, when we're um, engaging with Metrolinx um, on development applications, they're providing input into um, development files uh, where we're also applying the guidelines. And then, um, conversely, where Metrolinx has projects, um, they engage with the township and consult with us. And certainly, uh, we would be pointing to the guidelines as a as a document that um, you know the township is looking at or identifying as you know these guidelines provide a vision for what the township um, would like to see in this area. So if there's opportunities to incorporate um, or address the design guidelines in in their proposals, we would certainly ask them to, to do that. Thanks so much, Kristen. And I think there might be a follow up question here, just maybe talking about uh, transportation choices and how traffic flows maybe when trains arrive. And I know that the uh, the guidelines here try and speak to some of the multimodal options, whether you're arriving on foot or on bike or by car. So um, and, and so maybe that's something that, uh, you know, Kristen, you have anything to weigh in on that? Uh, yeah, certainly in terms of uh, transportation flowing through King City during train arrivals, I'm I'm, I'm not really sure uh, about the question. I'm not sure, um, Teresa, if you're able to elaborate there, but, um, you know, we certainly have a transportation master plan that speaks to transportation and, and the road network in the township. And then the design guidelines are looking to enhance or build upon um, that document. And we speak about the, um, you know, the public realm. So the streetscape, uh, the sidewalks, the bus, or sorry, the bike lanes, um, things like that, encouraging, um, those, uh, you know, good um, public realm standards to be applied through either development applications or when the township is looking to engage on a project for um, a street. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Kristen. And uh, thanks for the question, Teresa. And if you have any extra context, uh, certainly feel free to pop that in the, the chat as well, if that's helpful. Are there any other questions that folks might have? I see, a, I see one just came in, so give me a second. So the question here reads, uh, first starts with a thank you and, and for the work that's been done. Uh, can you explain how even with the existing residential neighborhood guidelines that we have already, or we already have, and with these new guidelines, we still have so many uh, massive houses going into the neighborhoods that are not matches in height, roof lines, setbacks, et cetera. Why and how are they approved? And so, I don't know, maybe Bobby, you could speak to the role of the guidelines in established neighborhoods and um, yeah, just get things off. Absolutely, yeah, so thanks for the question. Um, I think to date, the township hasn't really had a, a solid set of design guidelines to guide uh, new homes in the established neighborhoods. So I, I think um, these proposed urban design guidelines will actually help to fill that void and give the township a bit more a bit more teeth when it comes to reviewing applications for whether it be for minor variances or whether it be for site plans for uh, for new homes. So um, I'm hoping as the township implements the guidelines over time that you'll start to see a little bit of a shift in, in sort of the massiveness and, and the harmony of, of how of how the homes are being integrated into the neighborhoods. So so the, so I think this is a very positive, a uh, very positive direction for the township. Um, and, and like I said, you know, the township has other tools as well to help um, to help manage uh, that situation. Like there's a new zoning bylaw that was passed uh, just a few years ago that gives, I think, more specific neighborhood standards from a zoning point of view. So I think combined uh, the zoning and, and these new established neighborhood guidelines will better equip the township to, to help shape development in a more contextually positive way. so much, Bobby. 
Okay, I see a hand up from uh, Bryce. Why don't you go ahead, uh, Bryce? Hey, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, so with the understanding that, uh, that these are our guidelines, I mean, I really, I really think that they're a step forward. I think they're very positive. Uh, I live in downtown <laughs> Schaumburg on Main Street, and um, uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of opportunities here to to do some more development. You know, keeping these guidelines in mind. The part that I wasn't I wasn't totally clear on, and maybe kind of echo some of the other questions, is once these are you know follow the steps and are are accepted by council, they are they are guidelines. So my understanding is that if someone is applying for permission to you know to perform uh, some building or some renovations or to do any kind of development, they would want to reflect these guidelines in their design so that they'd have a better chance of having that uh, you know application approved but is there any requirement for them to follow them beyond maybe some of these pieces will be echoed into a zoning bylaw or some other kind of bylaw or are these just remain guidelines it's a great question bryce and i think we we we, we tackled this one yesterday evening as well um bobby do you want to kick it off perhaps? Uh, for sure, yeah. Um, thanks for the question, Bryce. Um, yeah, I, I think I think you characterize things quite well in, in that the guidelines, they don't really have a statutory kind of authority as, as a zoning bylaw does. So they, they're more of a negotiation tool, so to speak, and, and they do assist the township in reviewing applications. And like you said, I, I think, you know, in good faith, you, you kind of hope and expect that uh, developers will comply with the guidelines. And and if they don't, then you know that that changes sort of their chances of approval, just as you said. Um, and to answer your question specifically, I think there absolutely is a um, some opportunity for these guidelines to be embedded in, into the codes of the zoning bylaw. Um, you know, I like to think of all these different planning documents as feeding into one another. So when you finish one study, you come up with ideas that'll inform the zoning bylaw. So I, I, I can think, you know, I, I would imagine that now that these guidelines are done uh, and the township eventually will want to review their zoning bylaw, there, there might be some aspects of the guidelines that they'll want to codify directly in the zoning and, and give them a lot more strength. So I think over time, the township will, will be considering that. Great, thank you. That's very helpful. And, and I guess now we know what to look for for next steps. <laughs> Thanks so much, Bryce. Are there any other questions from folks? Um, oh, Frank, I see you waving on the video. Uh, yes, why don't you go ahead? You're on mute, perhaps. You're still muted. See if I can unmute you. Here, I'm gonna try ask to unmute and it might give you a prompt to do that. There we go, I think you're unmuted. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Great, thank you everyone. Uh, interesting presentation. Just to give you a little bit of my background, um, I live in King have lived in King for over 22 years. I have my children all live in King. I'm also very uh, involved on a day-to-day -day basis on the development of King, specifically in the old core or the established neighborhood, as you call it. Um, my company has built well over two dozen infill homes to date, and we probably have at least another dozen more lined up to do. We also have heritage homes that we own that we're planning on working with in King and understand the sensitivity to heritage buildings. I've had the privilege in my 40 years of the industry of working on many historical buildings around the GTA, predominantly in the city, but um, again, buildings that have been preserved to maintain the character. Where I have some concerns in your, um, I guess your report, you mentioned many things that I think I think need to be addressed uh, differently. One, 
the question about infill housing and the effect on established neighborhoods. I have a hard time defining established neighborhood. The areas that we build homes for our clients are neighborhoods that have homes that were originally built in the early 1950s. So you're talking about properties that are anywhere from a quarter to a half acre with a house that's about 1,000 to 1,500 square feet of a footprint. And if you try to compare that to today's modern day family needs, which are much greater than they were back in the 50s, uh, it's hard to try and make the two work together in a positive way. <clears throat> so when I get clients that move to King and the first thing they want to do is build themselves a new home. That's the purpose of moving to King because they love King City. They love everything about it. And when they want to raise and, and grow their families in an established neighborhood, sorry, established neighborhood, they look at what their wants are and how they can be implemented into the neighborhood. And if you took a drive around the neighborhood these days and the established infilled housing, you will see a big change. And the biggest change is yet to come. And I'll tell you why. Half of the bungalows inside those infilled residents are rented. They're rented because they're owned by people that are gonna eventually build and develop. And when I hear things about maintaining the status quo for the neighborhoods, I've been through this many years of my life. I've, I've been through this in neighborhoods in the city of Toronto where neighborhoods were just like the neighborhoods you have right now in King City, big properties, small homes. And they go through the transition where young families come in and they wanna build their new homes and the homes, yes, they're much bigger, their needs are much different. Back in the day, if you had a one car garage, you were happy. Today, some people can't, can't even content themselves with a three car. So the needs and the necessity of the people moving into King today are totally different than the people that have lived here for, I'm going to say 30, 40, 50 years. So your report needs to address not just the status quo, but how do you compare that to what's coming to King? And I meet the people that are coming to King every single day. I meet the people that are wanting to make King their home to raise their family. And King is changing. I'm sure you guys know that. It's changing daily. And it's going to keep changing. And hopefully it's going to change in a positive way. But to me, positive doesn't mean that because we have people that are against development because they're living in a 1,200 square foot bungalow. And all of a sudden, um, beside them, somebody's building a 4,000 or a 5,000 square foot two-story home that's going to overshadow them. That's it. That, that's going to happen regardless. So how do you control that? You're not going to control it by telling the people that are building a bigger home, oh, you have to maintain your roof height lower so that you don't block my sunlight. And by the way, I've got a 12 foot or 14 foot side yard setback. You should do the same. Well, that 14 foot side yard setback was built in 1956 for different reasons. It's not the same reasons that are going on today. So again, I agree there's got to be some controls because there are some bad designs out there and some bad, uh, what I call architectural uh, elements of what people are putting out there. But to just label everything as bad because it's big and it's overshadowing, this needs to be addressed because I witnessed in the city of Toronto in the 80s, neighborhoods that were being redeveloped, the, the city, because of the older I'll say the people that have been living in the neighborhoods for a longer period of time were against change. They were against, you know, um, intensification of modern uh, development. They went out and protested and it created a, a, a kind of a backdrop because what happened was now the city was forced to change the zoning. They started creating things like the low grade garages. Thank God we don't have that in King yet. But let me tell you what that problem created in the 80s in the neighborhoods like Avenue Road in Lawrence, uh, Bayview, Lawrence. It, it forced people to now create a below grade garage so they could accommodate the square footage of home that they wanted and also create enough parking for their needs. Well, that backlashed on them because that created another whole problem that they had to figure out and it just changed everything. So I'm asking that 
thought be given to all these ideas of how you're going to change the infra, uh, the input of new homes being built in established neighborhoods. I go through this problem on every project we get. You know why? Because we ended up at the Committee of Adjustment. And when we get to the Committee of Adjustment, it's what do you want versus what does your neighbor want? What does the city accept? What does the neighborhood accept? Everybody's different. And I think there has to be more thought given as to how you're going to move forward implementing uh, infill housing in established neighborhoods. Look around the neighborhoods you're referring to. I live in them. I build, I work in them every day. It's changing daily. It's not the 1956 bungalow that we're used to seeing. And if I may add to this conversation, I agree with the tree issue. I think some people are building today are not having any respect for the big mature trees that we have. And I feel that mature trees is one of the reasons why people want to come to King. To see a tree that's 75, 100 years old in the city, you got to live there another 50 years before it's going to happen. And if we don't put a control into those tree, those things like trees that are mature trees, then you're going to lose the beauty of King. It's going to take another 50 years for those trees to come back. So that, that and then the other thing I want to mention lastly, I have investments and I have development properties I'm looking to develop in the center core. The biggest problem we have right now with the center core, lack of parking. I'm sure many of you have driven corner of Keel and King Road, go to the restaurant at night, try to find a parking spot. It's ridiculous. And I've addressed this to the town, the council, to the mayor. You guys need to pay strict attention to where are we going with the parking? Because if you look at any uh, village in, in region, parking is the biggest problem. We don't have any municipal parking that can be considered municipal parking for people to go to when there's nowhere else to go. And if, if people like myself are going to develop properties in the core that are going to meet the requirements that the city wants, which, you know, height, size and everything, we need to get parking resolved. And I think a strong, strong um, thought needs to be given to parking because it's a problem today. Imagine 10 years from now, when everything gets built up and down Keel and King Road, where are people going to park? Anyways, I could go on and on because I, I, I'm very passionate about what I do. The people that know me, have worked with me, know that I take great pride in King. I consider myself an ambassador to King. I promote King every single day of my life to people all over Toronto GTA. So I want to make sure that my, my grandkids who now live in King, my family who live in King, get to enjoy and live in an in a environment that I think was given a lot of good thought and a lot of good planning and good people behind it to make it happen. Those are my thoughts. Okay, thanks, Frank. You covered a lot of good ground here, and I think I caught sort of three key pieces. Um, and so I might start with the established neighborhoods question uh, and, and pass that maybe to Bobby to speak about, um, you know, how, how the, the guidelines uh, speak to those compatibility pieces and change. Absolutely. Thanks, Frank, for coming out and sharing your, your opinion on, on everything. Much appreciated. Um, you, you know, and I can appreciate, too, I don't think it came across very well in the presentation, but we are trying to strike a balance, right, of trying to provide a bit of flexibility because we understand that there, there is a lot of pressure and demand for some degree of you know, floor space expansion and that sort of thing. And, and I think our intent with the guidelines is to strike the right balance of maintaining the desirable aspects of the different neighborhoods while still allowing for some flexibility um, within the design process. So we'll certainly take that, take that comment away for, for some further consideration, but I just, want you to, I just wanted to express that our intent is to you know, achieve that right balance and implement the, the associated policies of the official plan. Well, I, and I appreciate that you guys are giving it the thought, but you know, when I hear of people complaining about what's going on beside them, it's because they're being overshadowed. You live in a thousand square foot, 1200 square foot bungalow on a 75, 100 foot frontage of a property. The guy beside you is not gonna build a 1500 square foot bungalow because there isn't a person in this committee right now that would go and spend the money you have to pay to buy a bungalow to build another bungalow the same size. It's just common sense. That's the nature of the beast. So I respect that people are threatened by homes that are being built next to them that are overshadowing their light, taking over the mass of the property. 
but it's it is what it is it's it's progress and development in king king is not a little village somewhere in the middle of nowhere where people come with horse and buggy i mean king is moving if you look around king the people moving to king are people with young families growing multi-car uh on their driveways they have nannies they have requests they have needs and it's not a two little three bedroom bungalow there or a house that they're building and, and what I'm trying to say is that you have to look at both sides of the coin and, and try to find a balance. I respect the people that have lived in the community a long time and, and they're threatened by it. And I, I respect that. But at the same time, they have to understand that changes are coming and they're, they've been coming now since, I'm gonna tell you exactly, since you put the sewers in in 2008, because prior to right. that, you didn't have this problem. Yeah. And you didn't have the problem because people like myself and clients that come to me, we're gonna move to King without the sewers. And Frank, if, if possible, could the project team round out a few answers to some of the questions as well, and then certainly come back to some follow up. And, and then I think there was a question about some trees. Um, Kristen, would you be able to maybe speak to some of the, the trees around tree protection? That the township uses? Certainly. Um, and thanks, Frank, for uh, raising the matter and, and for all the comments that you're providing. Definitely, like Bobby said, striking a balance. Um, and certainly we're not we're not looking to stifle um, you know creative design through this um, through creating urban design guidelines uh, for the established neighborhoods. Certainly still want to see a variety of homes and and architectural styles. Um, but just having that that balance and um, you know there's there are little design tweaks that can be made um, to help. Uh, soften the look um, or um, the transition between the new build and maybe what's what's currently there. And one of those key aspects is landscaping. So one way to help soften a new new construction is to keep those large mature trees where it's possible. Um, those help to you know um, you know break up the facade when you're looking at the uh, or break up the streetscape when you're looking at the house from the street. So keeping large um, mature trees as well as requiring uh, new plantings. So where it may not be possible uh, to maintain a, a tree on a property to require new um, and obviously it might not be possible for like to like in terms of size but there may be an opportunity to require some more mature landscaping to be installed as, as a result of uh, the new construction that's going on and, and put it in the right locations so that it will have the effect of, of um, softening the look of a new home. And just to note, the township does not have a, a tree preservation bylaw. So there's um, no uh, bylaw requirement to maintain that vegetation, but it's certainly something we would look to address through a site plan review process in the established neighborhood to see, you know, like really exploring all options to maintain that the mature trees on, on the property. And then I think maybe Kristen, the last piece was just around parking um, and maybe just some of the things that the township is doing for around parking. Yeah, certainly. And uh, I've certainly experienced, uh, you know, in, on a, in a busy evening in King City, um, shortage of parking down in, uh, at King and in, in Kiel. Uh, the township does have a lot, um, but it's it's a little disconnected at this point in time. And that's uh, the north uh, west corner uh, where we have the, the park. There is some, some parking there, but it is a little bit more disconnected and removed from, you know, the restaurants at King and Kiel. So the township has done a, a parking study um, and that was done in a couple years ago. And it did make some suggestions um, where we would look to uh, encourage through development and redevelopment of any properties in the core to um, help, you know, connect uh, parking areas at the rear of buildings. Um, so that you don't have to go into one parking lot and then leave and then to go a few doors down, um, you know, ensuring some connectivity between private parking areas at the rear of buildings. Um, and then in, in trying to encourage other opportunities for um, municipal parking in the area. And it's certainly something that we'll continue to look at through the development review process um, moving forward. Can I make a suggestion to you? Of Re course to the committee that's looking at parking. There's a beautiful property on Doctors Lane that the city owns. 
And yeah. there's a marina there that's going to be obsolete once the new civic center up the street here move, gets done. That's it's certainly on our radar. That the city doesn't have to buy and spend money to allocate parking. And I'm well aware of the property you just mentioned on the west side. Yeah. Um, we even offered to uh, suggest to them that they could make that parking a little bit bigger if needed to accommodate more parking. And of course, add parking uh, paint lines on the parking lot so that people can see how many parking spaces are available to them. But yes, parking is definitely going to be a, a major issue in the center core, uh, in especially that, that intersection of Keel and King. And I'm aware of that because I'm developing that property on the corner. So I'm dealing with that as well. Thank you so much, Frank. Really appreciate the uh, the input. And uh, thanks, Kristen and Bobby, for uh, for weighing in. Um, I see, Michael, your hand is up. Why don't you go ahead? Hi, uh, yes. So I have um, not so much a, a question, but a, just a comment. Sure. Um, I think my perspective is interesting. I'm a... Uh, I live in an established uh, neighborhood in King City, right near King and Keel. I have a very young family. Uh, it's my third son, as you can see here. Uh, and uh, I know, like, if we look at Frank's comment, I think a, a lot of it was focused on the size issues and complaints about size. Just my perspective on this is, I actually don't care about how big the houses are. Like, it doesn't doesn't bother me. Um, my house was, I think, built in the fifties, maybe the sixties. Like, the size of the houses is not the problem. The problem is that the houses that are being built are architectural train wrecks. And like, if you look at the, the JTF houses are like the, the only exception to this. Everything else Thank you. is a mess. Like just complete, like not every house, but maybe like 18 out of 20. If you look at the infill houses, the replacement houses in King City, they're just not nice. Um, and it's not even that they're not made with expensive materials or whatever. I'm sure the materials are very expensive. They're just too many of them mixed together in ways that do not belong. Um, so I don't have any suggestion here. I'm just kind of raising that comment. Like it's not, it's not the size per se, that's the problem. It's just like, make them look nice. Thank you. If I may comment on Michael's comment, unfortunately, there's no municipality that has what they call architectural control where you can tell somebody who bought a property and say, you can't design it that way. It's got to look like this. Uh, in a, re, in a, a, like, for example, we built in uh, neighborhoods where they're restricted. There's a uh, architectural control. You can tell, yes, like, for example, Fairfields, you need the approval from the developer to get your house design approved. But in any neighborhood, in any municipality, I think it'd be very tough to um, push that line. And Michael, you made a very good point. I call there not all the homes that are being built in infill, regardless of size, are done tastefully. But that's like you telling somebody how they should dress in the morning. And, you know, it kind of gets a little on the personal side. But uh, I don't know if the city has any thoughts of having architectural control. And I would be the first one to volunteer as an architectural control candidate to comment on any homes that are coming in for development in the area, because I have this problem everywhere I built in King. Um, I look at what some people are putting together and I go, my God, what were they thinking? But again, you can't really tell somebody how they should dress or how they should build their house. It's kind of hard. Yeah, thanks, Frank. And thanks, uh, thanks uh, Michael. Michael, did that uh, address your comment or question? Or Kristen, yeah, do you want to weigh in on I mean, that? I was just, I was just wanting to kind of offer my yeah, opinion. yeah. Absolutely. I'm not suggesting that they're an architectural committee get together and approve or reject houses. Like I don't, I don't think that's reasonable. I just wanted to yeah. get a viewpoint out there. So. No, I, Kristen, I do you want to weigh in? Yeah. yeah, thank you, and thanks, Michael, for joining us, even with your hands full there. We really appreciate it. Um, certainly for taking the time this evening to join. Um, and provide that comment. So the township is looking to implement a process. Um, it's a site plan review process in the established neighborhoods where, you know, each each property where you're, there's a replacement home um, proposed or um, a major addition, we'd be looking to take them through a site plan control process. And through that process, we'd be applying these design guidelines. So it's not an architectural peer review process per se say like with a committee but it would be a review process where we would look at the elements 
um, in the design that are proposed and um, you know, ensuring compatibility is, is met with these guidelines. So these guidelines will play an instrumental role in um, helping to guide uh, future replacement homes in the community. Great, thanks, Kristen. See one last hand up perhaps from Bryce. Why don't you go ahead? Thanks. Um, yeah, actually, uh, sorry, I stuck two questions in here, but uh, the follow-up was, was, you know, to the to the point around, you know, what the, what the future is going to look like and, and what changes are coming. Um, you know, from from my perspective, uh, seven thousand square foot houses are not the future. The the future is decarbonizing and trying to minimize emissions through good design work as well as rules about insulation and uh, heat emissions and heating. So did these, did these guidelines uh, reflect any of those components? Um, I didn't think about this before, but, but it's a good point. If, if you know, 7,000 square foot houses are the future, then we need a way to, to make sure that, that it's a manageable future for everybody. Thanks so much, Bryce. I know there's a lot of good sustainability components in the guidelines. I don't know, Bobby, if you're able to speak to a few of them to kick it off. Oh, certainly, yeah. So, um, you know, to the extent that we can, um, we've tried to embed the principle of sustainability in the guidelines. Um, but, but as you know, and as as we chatted about before, you know, the guidelines sort of have a limitation in terms of their their teeth and their strength and applicability, but. At this point, you'll find in the guidelines, there are a number of um, encouraging statements trying to help to push developers to utilize more, more durable materials, more sustainable materials uh, to the extent they can to integrate energy efficient uh, systems and, and to, as I said in the presentation, also to try to utilize um, uh, or to provide more soft landscaping to help with, uh, with water drainage and so on. So. So yeah, the, the guidelines do speak to a lot of those different elements to the extent we can, and uh, and, and in large part they're they're sort of like encouraging kind of statements. And and I don't know, maybe the township has some context on the green development standards or some other tools as well. Yeah, uh, thanks, Bobby. That's a, a good segue. I just wanted to mention that the township is looking to develop um, some green development standards that would also apply to um, the established neighborhoods as well as all resident, well, um, all replacement homes in the township or new builds. Um, and those green development standards are actually up on our speaking page for consultation right now. So we're also looking for feedback in on that project. Uh, Aloma is the main contact there and, and there's lots of, um, you know, uh, direction in what the township is looking to uh, achieve through the, the green development standards. Um, so we'd certainly encourage you to check out uh, that project and provide your feedback back on that one as well. Yeah, it sounds, sounds great. Um, I, I know that some places uh, have started to, for example, ban nat new natural gas heating uh, at some point in the future, things like that. So uh, I'll take a look at the, at the, the green guidelines that are, are being proposed by the township. Thank you. I'll put a link in the chat to, to the page, just uh... beat, beat me to it. I was just having it loading up. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Kristen. Um, okay. So I'm not seeing any of your hands up. So what I'll do is I'll just reshare my screen and just uh, bear with me one minute here, folks, while I queue that up. Fortunately, but do, 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 do. and let's see if this works. All right. Are we able to see my PowerPoint screen? Yeah. yeah, okay, great. So just in terms of some contact and next steps. Um, so uh, on the screen right now are uh, Kristen and Aloma's contact information. Um, and, and certainly if you have any follow-up questions or comments or uh, something comes to you uh, immediately after hanging up the phone as, as uh, so often does, uh, you're certainly welcome to uh, get in touch with the project team and uh, these uh, questions and comments will be considered um, as, the, uh, as the guidelines uh, get, get finalized. Um, and so uh, feel free to jot this down, but it will also be on the speaking page, uh, which I'll flash up on the screen on the le next link in case you can't get it uh, written down. So on the screen is that link to the speaking page if you want to check a take a look. Um, and Kristen also popped a link to it uh, for the green development standards in the chat box if you want to check that out. Um, and you can also navigate to the homepage to view the guidelines project.
In terms of some of the next steps, and Bobby sort of touched on, on these at the high level in terms of the, uh, the project overview. Um, um, the project team will be working to finalize the draft village urban design guidelines based on all of this great input received today, yesterday, um, and, and in the coming uh, uh, coming weeks and, and um, you know, look forward to reviewing all those comments and, and sort of understanding the nature of them and uh, updating the guidelines accordingly. Uh, once that's done, uh, the final guidelines will be, be issued and they will be presented to Township Council uh, at a date to be determined um, in, in early in the new year. I do encourage you to uh, uh, take a look at the speaking page um, and, and it's a great opportunity to learn more about the project, view the, gu the draft guidelines, subscribe to receive future project updates, uh, watch the meeting recording. As mentioned, we will we have recorded this rather, uh, and and we'll be posting it. <laughs> Pardon me, <laughs> online in the uh, in the coming days, uh, and you can receive uh, future notifications. So I did see a question. Uh, one more question come in before we uh, formally wrap up. Um, and so it's just a question here uh, about, you know, kids playgrounds and sort of, um, you know, those recreational spaces maybe within neighborhoods uh, and just wondering, uh, you know, when uh, programs around updating and improving parks uh, will be considered. I don't know if Kristen, you're able to speak to that at all. Uh, certainly that would be, you know, our existing parks uh, would be under our uh, parks and recreation culture department and they would be you know, looking to uh, make improvements on those um, as, as uh, time progresses. But these guidelines would speak to, you know, um, connectivity to those uh, spaces and uh, any new development that's occurring in the areas um, to provide, you know, landscaping or um, playgrounds uh, to meet the needs of the community. Um, but I, I in terms of the, the parks being updated and improved, um, we'd have to get you into contact with uh, somebody in our parks rec and culture department to, to talk about any specifics there. Great, thanks so much, Krista. Well, um, again, everyone, uh, thank you for joining us this evening for this uh, second of two uh, public open houses. Um, uh, Kristen, is there any sort of uh, concluding words you want to, to share with the group? I just wanted to say thank you so much, uh, everyone, for coming out and spending your time with us this evening to talk about the urban design guidelines. And we really do appreciate your input and feedback. Um, any written comments would, would also be helpful. Um, and we'd um, encourage you to check out the speaking pages that we've provided uh, some links to in the chat. And uh, again, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank <laughs> you.